coming up on this special edition of Carolina Week. We'll take a look back at some of the semester's most compelling stories. From the rallies for immigration reform we followed across the state. To the campaign to improve pedestrian safety, a battle that continues today. Carolina Week was there. Our look back at spring 2006 starts now. From the School of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, this is Carolina Week. The spring semester in Chapel Hill has been one we'll never forget. Good evening, I'm Shelley Basinger. And I'm Crystal Calloway. Tonight, we revisit some of Carolina Week's most interesting stories and how they affected the campus community. People across the nation continue to campaign for immigration reform. One immigrants' rights march began here on campus. Reporter Chris Walker, Walker followed the students as they called out for justice for workers in North Carolina and Latin America. The Carolina Hispanic Association sponsored a march on campus Monday to coincide with the National Day of Action for Immigrant Justice. The rally is just one of many across the nation on April 10th advocating for immigration reform. A mix of students and community members started the march, which continued to Franklin Street and back to the pit in Lenore Hall. Freshman Sandra Henderlater collected signatures for a petition on the website April10.org. This would affect me personally because I have a lot of friends that are from different nations and not just Mexico and not just Latin America because immigrants is not synonymous, synonymous with, uh, with Latinos because that's not all it is. Organizer Pedro Carreño says he's pleased the community joined in the rally with students. That's one thing that just, just slipped my eyes up, uh, seeing all those people. Uh, we had about a group of 15, I said, and uh, from the opposing side of Franklin Street, just probably twice that number just coming to join us, uh, all wearing white with their flags, with signs, just showing their support. Students packed those signs and flags Monday afternoon to join a statewide rally in Siler City. In Chapel Hill, I'm Chris Walker, Carolina Week. Once the students arrived in Siler City, they were joined by more than 3,000 other marchers. Reporter Alex Villarell met one family that allowed her to share their story. This man, we'll call him Jose, is an immigrant from Guatemala. Jose and his family came to the United States in 1994. He tells me he currently works at a factory. Despite the difficult work, Jose is content to be in this country and refuses to give up hope about his future here. We've already started. We will not leave from here. If they remove us, we will return. Jose and his family, and others like them, joined forces in Siler City to take part in the National Day of Action for Immigrant Justice, which merged with the 20th Annual Pilgrimage for Justice and Peace. The march, sponsored by the Hispanic Liaison in Siler City, led to a rally in front of City Hall. We thank you. We came here in peace. We are going home in peace. Executive Director of the Hispanic Liaison, Ilana Lubeshe, says everyone banded together because current treatment of immigrants is unacceptable. We will not take this anymore, that it's time for comprehensive immigration reform that really addresses the needs of our community and of all the American people. This is Delfa, Jose's sister-in-law. Delfa wants people to realize most immigrants are simply hard workers with an American dream. We came with hopes of working and with hopes of triumphing in this country. Not all of us are just a burden for the government. Whatever the outcome, Jose and his family vow to keep fighting. No matter what the proposals are, we're always going to be here. If they benefit us, we won't do anything. If they don't benefit us, we will let our voices be heard. And everyone united, I know we will be victorious. In Siler City, I'm Alex Villarreal, Carolina Week. For Jose and his family, victory means enjoying all the benefits of the American dream in the country they now consider home. It's predicted that by 2025, the Hispanic population in the U.S. will reach 18 percent. Reporter Shaheen Sayal says with the growing number of Latinos, more people are learning Spanish as a second, second language, starting at a young age. Three, 
When kindergarten teacher Diana Sito starts her lesson each day, she has to keep one thing in mind. Some of her students might not understand what she's saying. That's because she teaches all her subjects in Spanish. It's the first year Siler City Elementary is offering a dual language kindergarten class where 15% of the curriculum is taught in English and 85% in Spanish. Principal Angie Brady Andrew sees the program as an excellent way to get both Spanish and English speakers on the same level. After all, research shows this is the best age to grasp another language. Now is the time. If people are going to learn a second language, it's so much easier for them, for children, to learn it and hold on to it. The dual language program at Siler City Elementary isn't mandatory. Parents can opt to enroll their children in the Spanish-speaking classroom Muy bien. or one of the eight other traditional kindergarten classrooms that speak English only. Diana says both the native and non-native Spanish speakers in the program are showing great signs of progress. But the most rewarding part for her is seeing the students' relationships grow because they are all able to communicate with each other. When you go out and they play together and uh, they talk and they say she's my friend or he's my friend, and you feel like, wow, this is working. We're doing good now. That was Shaheen Sayal reporting. Parents told her they are concerned that the native English-speaking students might fall behind, but Principal Brady Andrew reassures them the students are learning the grade-level content, just in a different language. A few spots on campus allow students to stretch the limits of language. Reporter Sarah Wiles found out these spots, called free speech zones, have sparked not only conversation, but controversy. UNC is one of many colleges that have so-called free speech zones. These are designated areas on campuses where student groups can hold spontaneous events without permission. Executive Director of the John W. Polk Center for Higher Education Policy, George Leaf, says these areas on campus hinder free speech and are unconstitutional. The, the First Amendment protects, at least on governmentally, governmentally sponsored campuses, uh, like the University of North Carolina, it protects freedom of speech throughout the entire campus. Not just, you can't just designate little zones and say you can speak freely here. This is the pit. It is one of four spots on campus where student groups can gather without prior approval. The other three free speech areas include Polk Place, the area in front of the Campus Y, which is currently under construction, and McCorkle Place on Franklin Street. Assistant Director of Student Affairs and Student Organizations John Curtis says these free speech areas can help prevent the disruption of academic activity. So this university has the academic mission, and first and foremost, classes take priority over everything. So. Free speech can, I'm not saying it is always, but can be disruptive at times, and that's not a problem, generally speaking, but if you're outside of the classroom, it could be disruptive. Many agree some restrictions on free speech are okay. The question remains whether free speech zones are a reasonable restriction. In Chapel Hill, I'm Sarah Wiles, Carolina Week. These free speech zones are causing legal battles at universities across the country about whether they promote or actually limit free speech. We'll never forget the rash of pedestrian accidents our campus witnessed this semester. Lack of a pedestrian walkway left one woman a widow. Coming up, a look at the changes she says must be made at this intersection where she lost her husband of more than 40 years. This is mommy's bed. Me and Jenny were jumping on it. Mommy's gun fell on the floor. I was a cowboy. Bang, 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 bang. I said, Jenny, wake up, wake up. It's just pretend. But she wouldn't wake up. Between 1997 and 2005, only six pedestrians died along Chapel Hill roads. 
Three were killed in a three-day span in January. One of them was UNC psychology professor emeritus David Galinsky. His wife, Maida Galinsky, spoke with reporter Philip Jones first. She reflected on his life and his passions. He loved psychology. He loved teaching. He loved it. He loved doing it. His passions were politics. And he was an incredible cook, so I will probably never eat well again. For David Galinsky, his kitchen was his getaway, a place to enjoy one of his favorite hobbies. But when he wasn't there, you could probably find him at the Dean Smith Center, where he watched his beloved Tar Heels take to the court as often as he could. What did he think about this year's basketball team? Um, you know, they were surprisingly good. And, um, you know, he would, he would get upset when things wouldn't work, but he would always go on to the next game. Basketball games were a tradition for the Galinskys. That's where they were heading the night David Galinsky died. Because they live only a few minutes from the Smith Center, Mrs. Galinsky would drop her husband off at this intersection. He would then cross six lanes of traffic and meet his wife at the Smith Center after she parked the car. As you can see, there's no crosswalk here. When Mrs. Galinsky got to her seat in the Dean Dome, she saw that her husband wasn't there. She then walked back to the intersection. That's when she found out her husband's trip and his life ended right here. My passion is now, in addition to social work and the beach, pedestrian safety and crosswalks and overpasses over that highway. Nobody else should have to go through what we have gone through and what that driver has gone through. It was not his fault, but he needed help not to have that happen. The North Carolina Department of Transportation says there have been no pedestrian accidents at the intersection in the past five years, but it will reevaluate the safety of the intersection. Until changes are made, Maida Galinsky hopes other pedestrians can learn from what happened to her husband. That it had to be my husband that is going to be the one that's going to make it clear for everybody. I'm really sorry because he was a wonderful man and I loved him. Um, but it, it shouldn't happen to anybody else. Nobody else should it happen to. Please don't let it happen to anybody else. That was Philip Jones reporting. Chapel Hill's traffic engineer told him the town petitioned the DOT for a crosswalk at the intersection where Galinsky died in 2000, but the request was denied. The DOT originally told us it had no record of the request, but later said it did find the denied request. Safety concerns extend beyond our roads. Reporter Sean Maroney looked into laws limiting where sex offenders can live. How would you feel if you discovered a sex offender lived near you or your child's daycare? Some say there's no reason to worry, but others don't feel so safe. Very nervous, very nervous. That's the way Kathia Hatcher feels each day as she leaves her four children at daycare, knowing that a registered sex offender lives directly Goodbye, across the street. Bye. Hillsborough daycare owner Rachel Kimber was unaware of her neighbor until Hatcher voiced her concerns. She came to me and told me that she had looked on the internet and saw that he lived across here. We also looked on the internet and with the help of the North Carolina Sex Offender and Public Protection Registry, we found this. We have a convicted sex offender, attempted second degree rape, and indecent liberties with a child. And it's that big white house yeah. right above that roof. So it's it's within viewing distance from your daycare. How does that make you feel? I feel that he shouldn't be able to live this close to a daycare or a school or anywhere around children. I was thinking that was one of the laws. More than a quarter of all states limit where sex offenders can live. North Carolina doesn't. A sex offender can live next to a school, a park, or even a daycare. If North Carolina had a law, then this offender would have to move. And he wouldn't be the only one. Orange County has 83 registered sex offenders. These red symbols mark where they live. And these blue symbols indicate daycares. We found offenders with crimes against children who live next to public schools, on school bus routes, and directly across the street from daycares. We took our findings to psychologist Dr. William Burlingame, who is an expert in working with sex offenders and their victims. It doesn't look good, does it? Well, not until uh, 
one knows a lot more, and then it may not look good either. Burlingame says we should look at each offender and make decisions on a case-by-case -case basis. He says he's hesitant to support a blanket law limiting where sex offenders can live. It's one of those items that is, uh, it seems to make intuitive sense, but we have no research on that one, uh, no research at all. I have uh, two victims, um, two boys. They were um, nine and 12. Meet John. He's a registered sex offender. He served a total of 10 years for his crimes in another state where there are proximity laws. He says he understands why the public supports these laws. They have this feeling of safety, even though that safety is not really there. He now lives in North Carolina. He's employed and goes to therapy. He doesn't think proximity laws are effective. To say it this way, if I want to commit a new crime, it doesn't matter where I live or what proximity I am from a school or a daycare center or a park, it's not going to make any difference if that's my intent. John does agree with Burlingame that appropriate restrictions on a case-by-case -case basis are a better idea. And the therapist knowing the person well enough to make the decision on where that person should reside. Do you take someone who committed the offenses that I did and put, put them next to a junior high school? That's probably not a good idea. I mean, just to be, you know, to be blunt about it. And Kimber agrees. Now, okay, just not only the daycare is here, I'm here, it's one that's over on Nash that, he, that he's close to, it's two or three schools that are right over here. John says Kimber shouldn't worry about the stranger across the street. The majority of sex offenders do not molest children that they do not know. Um, over 90% of sex offenders molest, that molest children molest those within the family or that are close friends of the family. Those statistics do little to comfort mothers like Hatcher. My goodness, you know, that's, that's something that uh, I cannot get, get out of my head. Please don't wait um, to something, you know, that happened to any, anybody in the community. But with no legislation on the table and no research to show the need for it, waiting is all Hatcher can do. In Hillsborough, I'm Sean Maroney, Carolina Week. Hatcher says she doesn't have plans to switch daycares, but she and Kimber hope lawmakers keep a watchful eye on offenders. I found out you also need to keep a watchful eye if you want to join a gym. You need to make sure you read the entire contract, including the small print. I talked to one UNC student who learned that lesson the hard way. UNC senior Jordan McCaskill likes to head to the gym about five times a week to stay in good shape. In 2003, she joined Women's Workout Club in Chapel Hill. She checked a box on her contract that said renew automatically, so she could get two years free as a promotion from the gym. If I hadn't checked the box, then I wouldn't have got my two years free, but who, who would have known they would have gone bankrupt? Women's Workout Club sold all of its memberships, including McCaskill's, to another gym. I had no clue on my contract that said anywhere they had the right to take my contract and send it to a new gym and automatically get me started with a whole new gym. That could be a different price, different, um, uh, different everything. The new gym was Ladies Fitness and Wellness, also in Chapel Hill. General Manager Kelly McLaughlin says staff members tried their best to appease their new customers. For the people that were in the middle of their memberships, we gave them the option either of fulfilling their contract, um, whatever that time period may be, and just paying it out, or they could uh, break the contract by paying a $50 cancellation fee which is our policy. McCaskill paid the fine and eventually joined a different gym. Consumer Protection Division lawyer David Elliott says nothing in the contract says a gym can't sell its membership. Without a, a statutory basis for getting out of the contract, there, 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 there's just no, there's no legal way to get out without losing that money. Elliott is referring to the NC statutes, a part of the Prepaid Entertainment Contracts Act. The statutes describe how a gym is allowed to transfer or sell memberships. For example, the new gym must be within eight miles, and it must be considered comparable to your old gym. McCaskill also had billing problems with ABC Financial, women's workout club's billing company. Many gyms use billing companies to get payments from their members. When you sign a one, two, or three-year contract with a gym, the facility sells your contract to a billing company and is guaranteed full payment. They may have a an individual who's contractually bound for three years. And so rather than waiting to get the money month by month for three years, they will sell that contract to someone, take their money up front.
Like the Attorney General's Office, the Better Business Bureau also receives complaints about gyms. President and Eastern Bureau CEO Beverly Baskins. Well, a lot of the questions and complaints we get about gyms at the Better Business Bureau have to do with contracts. And, and most of the time it's because the person who has signed the contract, the customer hasn't really read it or doesn't understand it and hasn't asked the right questions. Here's what you should do before signing a contract with the gym. Take a tour of the gym. Get a breakdown of prices. Know how the gym's cancellation policy works. Ask questions about anything you don't understand. And most importantly, read the contract. To make sure you have a good contract, ask these questions. Buyers can cancel their membership within three business days of signing a contract. Is there a buyer's right to cancel clause near where you will sign? The statutes explain how gyms are able to transfer your membership. Are the statutes clearly stated and bolded? McCaskill's right to cancellation clause wasn't near where she signed, but at the top of the next page. Also, the NC statutes weren't listed on the contract. She says her experience has taught her a lesson. It's a, it's a big eye-opener when you sign something and it comes back to bite you because I used to be like, oh, whatever, sign my name, give me all the discounts or whatever, but nothing more. McCaskill also told me she never really felt comfortable signing her first contract. She says it's important to make sure you're making the best decision instead of just giving in to your promotion. Well, sportscaster Michael Crow joins us now. And Michael, wasn't it a very memorable year in sports? It sure was. Women's basketball, men's basketball, everyone really played great, great this spring season. Coming up in sports, the women's basketball team was one of the biggest success stories of the past year. We'll take you through some of the highlights of the season, including the Heels' monumental victory over Duke in January. When you buy disposable and overpackaged products for your home, you're really saying, hmm, I'm fine with depleting natural resources. Pollute our air and water. Energy, wasted. People tell you, hey, go for less packaging. Check out reusables. Buy stuff in bulk. Well, you tell them, no thanks. I'd rather throw it all away. Buy smart, waste less, save more. Welcome to Carolina Week Sports, I'm Michael Crow. The women's basketball team had one of the most memorable seasons in recent history, and perhaps no game was more memorable than the January 29th game at second-ranked Duke. I was lucky enough to cover that game. Carolina found itself in an unfamiliar position at Cameron Indoor Stadium. Duke out-hustled the heels in the first half. Head coach Sylvia Hatchell says the Blue Devils had more desire. Duke was out playing us. They were getting all the loose balls, all the tie-ups, you know, they were just playing. They played harder than we did in the first half and like they wanted it more. The solution? Simple. Let's just go out there and rebound and tighten up our pressure defense and let's get the ball inside. Let's move more than we're moving, you know, and take advantage of our athleticism and our quickness. And Carolina executed, led by a tenacious Ivory Latta and a dominating 23-point performance by Orlana Larkins, both inside and outside, the heels fought back. Latta penetrated at will and added six assists to her 17 points. Carolina stepped up defensively with 14 steals and held Duke below 40% shooting in the second half. With less than a minute remaining, this Latta drive and Latangela Atkinson's free throws sealed the four-point victory. I'm proud of my team. We fought hard. You know, I, I was telling them, please don't get down. You know, we practice harder in practice. You know, game's supposed to be easy, and we came together at the end, and that's why I love them so much. I mean, this is nice, but I'd like to have it the last game of the season, you know. You know, we know that we can't uh, let down in any way, shape, or form because we got that big zero, I mean, that big uh, bullseye on our backs, and everybody's coming after us. The win against Duke helped catapult the Heels to just their second Final Four in school history. Even though Carolina fell to Maryland in the first semifinal game, the Heels' trip to Boston was overall a success. Reporter Brian Allen traveled with the team and has the behind-the-scenes look. Emotions ran high as the team left Chapel Hill on the team bus and boarded their charter flight to Boston for the 2006 Women's Final Four. When they arrived in Boston, they were greeted by an authentic town crier who had an update on an old classic. Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the Women's Final Four this year. 
as well as a few gifts for the Tar Heel ladies, jewelry from Tiffany's. After a free day on Friday, it was back to work for the Heels on Saturday with an autograph session and an open practice at TD Bank North Garden. The mood was light despite the tough drills Coach Hatchell ran them through. Almost half the lower bowl was filled with Tar Heel fans, although at least one of them clearly wasn't having any fun. After practice, Coach Hatchell was whisked away for the presentation of the AP Coach of the Year Award. Being at the University of North Carolina is just a, I mean, a dream come true for me. Sunday was the day of the big game, and even though the Tar Heels fell for just the second time this season, and the ever-present smile was absent from Ivory Lotta's face, and Orlando Larkins, on her 20th birthday, was left speechless, these players have no reason to hang their heads. Just by making it to Boston, they prove that they belong among the nation's elite. From Boston, I'm Brian Allen, Carolina Week Sports. The women's basketball team fell short of the ultimate goal, but they finally got a lot of the attention and respect that they deserved this season. They worked hard for that. They, they really did. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Mike. Can an old dog learn new tricks? Well, it depends on how well you teach them. Find out what it takes to make these pooches sit so still, coming up. If you have a story idea, contact Carolina Week at 843-8292. You can also visit us online at carolinaweek.org. If you have questions about this program, write Carolina Week at Campus Box 3365, UNCCH, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, 27599. If you're thinking about getting a puppy, this next story is for you. Reporter Lindsay Michael found a place where you can send your pet to get top-notch training. Parker, come. It's Parker's first day of training, and he's already figured out if he sits still long enough, someone will give him a treat. Dog trainer Jenny Hill starts training dogs like Parker with positive reinforcement. The first day we start out with motivational training. Um, that way it makes obedience fun for the dog. If Parker does what he is told the first time, he gets a treat. If he doesn't, he gets a little tug on the special collar called a prong collar. What it's meant to do is when you give a slight tug and release on the collar, it comes in and the prongs kind of pinch him on the neck like a mother correcting her young. Parker seems to enjoy the extra attention he gets when he does something right, and he's catching on quickly. Lucky come. This dog has been in training for only one month, and you can see he's learned a lot. If you decide to do dog training, you can teach your dog to come, sit, stay, and down, and always reward him with a treat that he enjoys. So how do the dogs feel about all this attention? <laughs> Maybe I'll ask again after we teach them to speak. In Chapel Hill, I'm Lindsay Michael, Carolina Week. Well, from perky puppies to peculiar pizzas, here's a story that might make you think twice about what you grab for dinner. Reporter Paula Cerruti tells us how what you like on your pizza is a good indicator of your personality. I like uh, jalapenos and fresh tomatoes. I like pesto and sausage and spinach. Uh, we had a cheese and a pepperoni. I like anchovies and mushrooms. It's my favorite pizza. Everyone has favorite pizza toppings, but have you ever thought about what this says about you? That I'm a spicy kind of guy. I like change. I guess that I'm not very experimental with my pizza. I think it says I'm adventurous and no one else is going to eat this pizza. Dr. Adam Hirsch at the Smell and Taste Treatment and Research Foundation says there is a link between people's favorite pizza toppings and the personalities. For example, people who prefer non-traditional toppings, such as pineapple or anchovies, tend to be aggressive and natural leaders. Those who like single meat toppings are described as irritable. Multiple meat topping lovers like to be the center of attention. I think people would be too busy eating all the meat on their plate to want to be the center of attention. And vegetable eaters are empathetic and understanding. This says, I'm aggressive and a natural leader, and I like men who are the same. So meat and anchovies and tomato, if you are ever in Chapel Hill. Whether you're alone, with your buddies, or on a date, remember, pizza toppings can say something about you, so order wisely. In Chapel Hill, I'm Paula Ceruti, Carolina Wake. 
Well, that's really interesting that what you have on your pizza actually says that much about you. What's your what are your favorite pizza toppings? I'm a veggie lover. I'm, I'm vegetarian, so I'm a veggie lover, and I think that means that I'm understanding. Oh, well, I think that, that fits you to a T. <laughs> thanks, Shelly. <laughs> well, thanks for watching this special edition of Carolina Week. Have a great night.